The systems of finance are human made. The systems of economics are human made. They can change. And they're changed by people using their voice and standing up to make some positive change through the power of finance. Today on the Second Renaissance, I sit down with an old friend, John Treadgold, who's a sustainable investment expert as we decode the business case for sustainability. We find out what the difference between ESG and impact investing is, the positive short and long-term influence that the financial services industry can have on moving the climate needle, how to finesse our storytelling to convey the massive business opportunity that comes with sustainability, and why John is now so confident speaking his truth and making a significant impact in raising investors and the community's awareness of the climate upside. He is a climate optimist, an activist voice, and he vulnerably shares his own life stories, the ups and the downs, and it becomes clear in today's episode that just as John has faced personal challenges, bullying and headwinds and overcome them, his own journey of facing adversity symbolizes the old notion that there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Equally, the time for the ideas that he espouses and has become a voice for sustainable and impact investment has come. And John is perhaps the perfect bellwether for this movement. Quick word on pedigree. John is a communications consultant for companies working on climate solutions. He specializes in content strategy to help sustainable investors and climate tech startups accelerate growth and cut carbon and translates financial jargon into human meaning for organizations like Perpetual, the World Bank Group, MLC, and the UN. He's the host of the Good Future podcast, and it was great to listen to John for this episode of The Second Renaissance. I trust you will find this conversation equally enlightening and moving. John Treadgold, welcome up to Avalon Beach and to The Second Renaissance. What a pleasure. Any yeah. excuse to get up to Avalon, it's great. I know, and have a have a little reunion after, I think we calculated like 23 years or something. It's been a long like time, been a long time. I Followed your progress, but great to be here. Yeah, luckily nothing's changed in those <laughs> Nothing 20, at all. 23 years. I believe the year was 1999 and we left year 12 in Canberra and um, we were just talking about culture and how cultures have shifted. Uh, even sort of, you know, reflecting back to our school culture, which at the time we both had a little bit of a tough experience at school. Um, I was reflecting on, you know, doing some therapy posts on bullying at school and all the rest. But, you know, um, we've all had that experience of, I think we went to what was, in my mind, quite a sort of a school that had quite a lot sort of misogynistic culture, a bit xenophobic, uh, very mainstream. And... Now that I've gone back to the school, it's totally changed. It's become much more diverse, much more inclusive, much more focused on sustainability, regenerative agriculture, etc., which is all kind of your wheelhouse. Just take me through what's happened over the last 23 years. And as a sustainability guru, how do we land ourselves here in 2022, 23 years after we left school with what's been a sort of a zeitgeist shift, maybe not just in school cultures, but overall in sort of societal culture that's a big question i know but there's a lot there yeah. well and going back to school and finishing in 99 that makes us the oldest of the millennials and i think that alone is pretty interesting i think as we mentioned before our school and that that nature of a, a macho footy head culture i think that that was really it was just on the wane and i think that sort of washed away um and it, i mean it took a long time to get to um you know the me too movement and, and that kind of thing but you look at schools, I mean, I think our all-boys school is now co-ed. That's a big shift. Yep. Uh, and that's right, sustainability is, is a core element there. But we were the oldest of the millennials. We were at school without mobile phones and without Facebook. And then it was when we left school and went to university that all of that came on. Mm. And I think that makes us the older, wise ones of that moment. Because if you're that bit older, you didn't quite have that, that entree when you were still emerging. But then people who... We're younger. I mean, imagine being a teenager and all you've known is an iPhone. It wouldn't seem miraculous. It's just the way it is. So mm. from a futurist perspective, you probably think about a lot of those issues. But I often 
think that we, as a generation, I really hate those generational uh, mm. stereotypes. But I think that one's quite interesting. Mm. Uh, and when we, I don't know, when our kids are older, when we have grandkids and we say, well, I'm older than the internet, right? And explain to them that we didn't have phones or internet when we were young, that'll blow their mind. It'll be mm. like our grandparents who said, oh, I you know, walked through the snow and had to you know, lead a horse to get the pail of water. It'll be just as radical, I think. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. So that's us. But look, a quick scan of where I'm at, what my, I mean, <laughs> I'll scan of my career. I'll, I'll give you a few dot points and you can jump in. Um, finished school, went and studied um, economics and business. I really liked economics. It sort of worked for me because I think it was about uh, how the world works. And I really engaged with that. I did business and accounting. I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it. And then did an economics course and was like, oh, wow, that's great. So I shifted and, and did a major. And then being a good Canberran, went and worked for the government, um, finance department. Well done. Full, um, full, full marks, yeah, full ticks. That's it. Good um, Canberran boy. And went and spent some time in Canada, actually. And so many people ask me, do you surf? <laughs> that and I, you're like, no, nah, I'm from Canberra. We I have Lake Burley Griffin. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I was committed yeah. that when I got home, I will uh, learn to surf. Hmm. And also there was a lot of awesome mountain biking over there, so I was also going to get a good mountain bike. So I came home and I moved to Sydney. And again, worked for state government um, for the environment department, actually, the EPA, working on some of their emissions measurement stuff. Moved to, I moved to Manly, actually, and that's come full circle because now I'm hmm. back up on the beaches. Um, but yeah, learned to surf, uh, which is still my number one love. Actually, I've just had a baby boy, so... Now my number two love. He'll that's be with right. you on the board in no time, oh, no he doubt. He's going to be, that's yeah. right. He's not, he's not walking yet, but we'll probably get him on the board before that. Yeah. Um, I think there was an interesting pivot where I never quite found my place. I never, I didn't, I never had a job like a lawyer or a doctor. It was never a clear study something and this is your role. Um, I've always been a generalist. I've called myself a hopeless generalist, but nowadays I'm leaning into it and I really enjoy it. And so one day I had a job what you'd call a pretty good govy job. I had a, a cool little house in Redfern, but I quit and I left the house and I loaded up my car and I moved to Byron Bay. And I said, well, I'm always going to have this itch. So I'm going to scratch it. And, and what's the itch? The itch was to throw it all in and go live at the beach. Mm. And so live. it's past tense. The, t the itch has been scratched. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I'm still, you know, I still want to live by the beach, but I still, I, I learned, I lived there for two years, it was great. I studied economics, but I've always loved writing. That goes back to our school days and a very good English teacher that, that we both had. Um, uh, quick cap nod to Mr. Peter Rudge. Yeah, Thank he's you. out there. Mr. Rudge, reach out, you're a legend. And so, yeah, I moved to Byron and, and wrote a book, wrote a novel, but did appreciate, did learn that I think I needed more intellectual stimulation. I wanted to live in a city. I wanted to be where it was happening um, and yeah and be part of it so mm. I ended up moving back and I went and studied a, a master's of international relations the surfing passion had taken me to uh, Indonesia spent a lot of time over there and I'd worked on development projects so I always really liked this these concepts of international development why cultures are so different why some cultures have developed and others haven't um, and the influence of language there I studied the master's uh, international relations and international law which was great, really loved it. Again, though, uh, didn't come out of it thinking I'm going to be an international relations something. I mean, I guess that's your diplomat mm. or, or that kind of thing. Um, but uh, at the end of that course, I did uh, was able to do an internship and discovered that I could do that anywhere. So I looked into New York and ended up going to do an internship at the UN Global Compact, and that was a great trip. So, two so what did they do at the UN Global? compact so the global like compact us. yeah so it's the un body that interacts with the private sector and most un bodies are related to to states to countries but the global compact is a compact it's an agreement that companies sign up to it's got nine or ten principles i should know it's been a while yeah and so they sign up it's an agreement to abide by a certain set of UN-based rules, so it's you know, human rights and SDGs and sustainability and all those sorts of bits mm -hmm. and pieces. And that was a great experience. Mm -hmm. Really smart people in New York. You know, I'd never been to New York. Um, such a great experience. And while I was studying, I'd got a job at QIC, 
which is a fund manager, which was rare because mm. everybody else was working for government roles and that sort of thing. And they said, well, if you work in finance, what about impact investing? And I said, impact what? I'd never heard of this thing. So You're like, investing is just for making money, right? Exactly. Well, and that's it because I had these two um, – sides of my personality of my world this career which was um had, had been shifting in, into the world of finance and then on the other side this passion of international relations and, and that was travel and that was you know cultural exposure and all of these things um, and then when i started digging into impact investing i realized oh hey this is bringing these two things together creating positive change in the world um, but doing it through the power of finance so Awesome experience in New York. Got back to Sydney and dived headlong into impact investing. Give us a little time stamp here. What year is this? Year is While this? I open a fully green-powered, locally produced XPA from Modus Operandi. That's excellent. Um, it must have been about 2015. So impact investing. This is kind of like kind of early days. Mm. I mean, certainly pre-COVID when investing was all about just making money and few people thought about maybe the impacts. Definitely, because I got back to Sydney and dived in to, to find, is there, a, is there a community here in Sydney? And I found there was, and it was amazing because it was really intelligent people that had the similar itch to make some positive change, um, but appreciating that finance could be done better. And if you look back at the traditional definition of impact investing and where did it come from, it was around 2008. A group came together, the Bellagio Hotel in Italy, and formed this concept. Um, that's where the, the GIN started, the Global Impact Investment Network. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was a response to the problems of finance and the excesses that caused the global financial crisis. And that certainly made me reflect um, on that shift. And I think uh, in terms of the link, I mean, even when I, I was studying economics, year 2000 and my girlfriend was studying environmental science so i was a business guy and they're all the hippies and again it's that um the duality of life mm -hmm. and, and that contradiction that i really like and that was you learn a lot at university but i think we we both that those two groups coming together all her friends and my friends the debate and arguments were awesome and we all got on and we all learned from each other uh and and did anyone straddle both those two worlds or were they mutually at, exclusive at that time not really because we were studying right mm. um but i think we all absorbed it and i certainly did it it was definitely an influence that's been with me the whole time um even to studying economics i'm sure that was influencing it but i felt that economics isn't valuing you know the theory it wasn't effectively valuing environmental resources uh negative externalities Right. I'm not sure if people have heard this term. It's a pretty innocuous term, negative externalities. It doesn't sound that bad. But I mean, I, I think of a better term almost as like collateral damage. <laughs> so you're running a business. What's the collateral damage that you're doing? Yeah. I mean, you're running a factory. Well, like what's happening with your wastewater? Um, you I'm know, sure the polluters are very well aware of that. Yeah. And they're definitely like, oh, no, it's just negative externalities. Don't mm. worry. Something I mean, like it's, a, it's a great sort of lobbyist <laughs> term, right? It's the same with climate change rather than global warming it's the mm. same with emissions rather than pollution disposable coffee cup as opposed to yeah. single-use plastics you know exactly mm. no, and, and that's the role i've rolled into is communications and, and think it's really powerful mm. um and for people at home negative externalities it's essentially the uh, uh a cost to society from a product that's not not factored in to the price of the product mm. so pollution is one because the factory doesn't pay for it, but society does. I think, you know, mental health damage of social media, society pays for it, the companies don't. And so economics does, and I remember this back in Econ 101, they describe what they were, they'd say a good example, the most obvious example is pollution, but don't worry, because we've got a cap and trade system. It's a carbon tax, but not really. It's more nuanced than a carbon tax. It says, uh, let's have financial incentives so that the easiest to abate emissions are the ones that, that get dealt with first. And for those really hard to abate sectors, well, they can pay their way right through carbon credits. Anyway, even I can't explain it all mm. that well now. Um, and I think that this is why we've never had a carbon trading system. It, well, we had it briefly in Australia, but it's gone. The European one is 
it's doing okay, but it's had some problems. Um, and it's just really difficult politically to get it through. So if you take an academic intellectual perspective to it, that's the answer. But the political reality is that it just, it just doesn't work on the ground. So that's, I think, an indictment on the economic system, economic theory generally. Anyway, we've gone off on some tangents. I'm not sure where we were. I'm going to stop. But um, We're summarising and compressing 23 years of, of, of personal evolution and, and, and societal change here into, into a few minutes. So that's totally fine. We were talking about the gin and, and 2015 and, oh, uh, right. and uh, impact, uh, investing. In, impact investing and that sort of eureka moment. I guess that's where the two worlds maybe collide or coalesce together in a sort of a sweet spot where... I'm imagining that you'll have a eureka moment which says, these two things are not mutually exclusive. You can invest and have impact. Yeah. Um, am I, am I totally. foreshadowing what we're about no, no, to hear? Definitely, uh, you know, definitely coalescing, one of my favorite mm -hmm. words. Mm -hmm. There were people like Dan Mandevin, Rosemary Addis, that were really um, central to this space. Dan Mandevin is famous for, his, for the way he's very good at explaining these things. And he always said, his first challenge in those years was trying to explain it to people because you'd walk into the, the finance types and they're like, what are you talking about? It's not going to work. Like, mm. we're pragmatic investors. Like, it's the bottom line. That's it. And he said, well, it's like a platypus. I was like, a platypus? What are you talking about? He's like, if someone described a platypus to you and you'd never seen one, you'd just be like, well, what are you talking about? You know, it's got a flat bill and it's got a little claw and it's a mammal that has eggs. And has a poisonous tail yeah, or something. Under, right? under, <laughs> a little claw under its pad, right? And you just, if someone explained that to you, you'd be like, what is this thing? Mm. Like, no way that can exist. Mm. So that's how he described impact investing. If someone explained it to you, you'd be like, no, no. But then in practice, it works. Mm. And, and sure, in those days, it was um, private markets. A lot of family offices were driving it because they had that, that link where they had money to invest but wanted it to be aligned with their values. And that came out of a lot of the private investment houses. Um, but from then, it's, it's really taken on a life of its own. Mm. I came into this space and was... I was sort of clambering for well, how can I be part of it? But what I realized was, as Dan had said, getting people to understand this thing is the first part of, of that hype cycle. And so I started a podcast, the Good Future Podcast. Which of course we highly recommend to all the listeners and, and viewers out there. Not only is the content fantastic, but you've got some great humans uh, doing some amazing things on, on the podcast and you guys make great sense decoding some some big sustainability terms for for the for the lay person and you know for the expert as well the thought leaders in the space that i interview they're you know leaders in their field in finance um but the thing that they most 90 percent have a story about this shift about a light bulb moment they might say you know, i was working in investment banking and i was sick of making rich people richer and i went to india and had some light bulb moment and they come back and there's a shift. Um, so it just makes them really interesting people to mm. talk to, but also really intellectually stimulating because we've got this depth of, um, of breaking through in the same way that I was you know, pulling apart the economic models, breaking through what are these norms of finance and are there different ways to do it? Can we value things differently, better? How can we value the environment to save it? And of course, the scourge of climate change is upon us um, and that's, only gotten worse and I think that's been a big part of the momentum in, in the space and so the podcast was great a lot of personal development myself is probably the biggest value people are like oh you know are you going to monetize it it's monetized itself because it's taught me so much right? mm. and um, I met a lot of people and and so I suddenly went from the naive beginner uh, knocking on doors can we have a coffee I've got questions it turned from that into lots of people coming to me and asking me questions so it was, you know, it was students wanting to get into this space, but it was also other investors outside saying, we need to understand this thing. What was interesting was that while they understood the finance side of it, they said, what do we call what we're doing? And they needed help with the communication side of things. And I think that that's still, <laughs> it's still unclear. There are still um, arguments about definitions. And for a communications consultant, that's great. That's kept me in bread and butter for a while now. Mm. And so it shifted from me asking questions to people coming to me podcast grew and then COVID hit. Yeah. And of course, the prediction was that everyone would stop caring about this little environmental itch because we were in survival mode, right? So no one would be thinking about organics or supply chains or, um, you know, 
biodynamic or regenerative farming because it was all just about staying at home. But how wrong they were. Because no doubt, like, COVID's also been a bit of fuel to fire on the whole sustainability and ESG movement, no doubt. It proved that people thought of it as, as following the general rules of finance, which is when there's a downturn, people just, as you said, they flee to safety, you know, that's a, that's a nice to have. We'll ditch that. Mm. We've just got to back they, down. They, they buy Philip Morris and they buy Woolworths. Exactly. And, and they, companies, you know, you know, resources yeah. when there's a downturn, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But people appreciated that. I think a combination of there's more to life to money and that doesn't matter how much money you have. If you're stuck in your house, it doesn't do you much good. Mm. So I think that was an interesting moment that people had money, but they realised it doesn't matter. You know, freedom and family and health mm. is really all that matters. So I think that was an interesting moment. And look, we in Sydney didn't have it that bad to other people you know, living mm. in, in um, more heavily populated areas. But the question was, in the lead up from 2015 um, onwards, ESG and impact investing, um, uh, will it survive a downturn? That it's a fair weather trend um, and then in the downturn it'll all get flushed out. And so you know, the, the naysayers were, were waiting for that. But the opposite happened. We have had a, a downturn in markets at the moment, but a year ago, the ESG funds had outperformed this RIA, the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia. I think they said it was three, five and 10 year time horizons that the ESG funds outperformed, right? So I, I should probably um, help define, because this is always the issue, people put ESG and impact investing in the same bucket. ESG, of course, environmental social governance. And ESG is actually really simple. From an investor's perspective, it's just a risk overlay. So it involves uh, an investor including environmental, social and governance factors in their investment decision making. So that's what investors do. They, they judge return against risk. And they take data points and they look at financial statements. They pull in all sorts of data. And the better investors pull in more data. And ESG is just another set of data. Right? And so I don't think it's a values judgment. It's just more data. And more data is surely better because you can ignore it. You can use it. You take your position and the market will, will give you a result. So that's ESG tends to more uh, to operate in public markets because um, you don't have as much of a shareholding. Impact investing, on the other hand, is a more nuanced, more detailed approach uh, that is more and more operating in the public markets, but tends to be in the private markets where you can set the three characteristics of impact investing, that it's intentional, uh, that it's measurable, and that you can contribute to the impact of a company. And so that means, you know, you intended your money to go into a certain company to, to make positive change, uh, that you can measure it. So impact measurement um, is, a, is a growing space, and it's very interesting in terms of measuring more than just the financial metrics, it's measuring the impact metrics. So give me yeah. one impact metric here just for our listeners to get a sense. Sure, so if you look at a company, you might say it's got these earnings, um, it's got this many staff, it's got this much debt. But on the other hand, you could say, you could look at a climate change perspective and say, but it produces X number of CO2 emissions every year. You could have two identical companies and if one's producing more CO2 than the other, in the past you might not have looked at that factor and they're identical companies, but suddenly there's a difference. Now, that's just an output. Impact measures an outcome. So what does that mean? What's that impact on the world, right? So is that affecting the biodiversity? Is it affecting the greenhouse effect? Still, there are some impact investors that just report outputs. You know, however, how many um, students we've funded at a school, or how many mosquito nets. But the real power of it is me measuring the impact that that has on society, which is really hard. Mm. It's a really subjective factor. And I think that's actually the key difference between ESG and impact investing. ESG measures the risk of the world on a portfolio, but impact measures the impact a portfolio has on the world. And that's quite profound, I think, mm -hmm. um, because investing in an ESG portfolio, people say, you anyway, know, there've been a lot of criticisms of ESG lately, saying, oh, but look, emissions are still going up and mm -hmm. it hasn't saved the world, but it's been criticized for failing to do something it was never designed to do. And that comes down partly to uh, the hyperbole of the fund managers building ESG funds. And the is markets. there a bit of greenwashing there that it's been maybe too easy to well, say we've got this ESG look, fund? Spectrum, right? or, I, yeah. I called it hyperbole, you know, mm -hmm. the market is going a little bit too far. And I think the risk there is that it does push into greenwashing. And now we're seeing 
pretty high profile court cases in Europe and, and even the ACCC here are looking into it from a corporate perspective. And so those definitions are being are really important um, and not to overstate your claims. But yeah, I think, think of it as a spectrum, as a sustainable investing spectrum. At one end you have ESG investing, which is the baseline. It's not gonna save the world, but it's a really important start to add some other analytical factors into your investment decision making. And along the way, you've got ethical investing and you've got sustainable investing and they're gradually increasing the, the avenues for change, you know, engagement, you engage with the company and send them letters and be a bit of an activist investor. Sustainable investors look for these sustainability factors. And then you get up to the, the gold standard, which is impact investing, which is measuring the impact that company has on the world which is really complicated and really difficult. It's easier in private markets because you can have a seat on the board and you can control the company. So how do private investors get access to this? You know, your mom and pop, uh, they might buy a good, you know, exchange traded fund, for example, or they, you know, they might go for ETHI as a, you know, as a, as an ethical fund, for example. I'm not making any financial advisory, you know, yep. statements here. But when they go, how, how do we kind of move from some of these things that are being marketed in the Fin Review on the weekend, where you have access and and probably some of those, you know, funds are heavily loaded towards tech, which recently when we recall this episode in December 2022, you know, has had his issues with Meta laying off, you know, 10,000 people and Amazon the same and, you know, Alexa being a massive flop and all these other things, right? How do they go, okay, well, actually you want to go for the gold standard of, of impact investing. Is there an avenue for them to, to participate in, in this space where it's not just, you know, someone who's who's able to wrap, you know, a few companies doing, you know, fairly well um, towards the gold standards? Yeah. Oh, look, it's probably the number one question that I get asked is, how can I, a regular Joe retail investor, access these impact investments? Mm. Like, I want to invest in that wind farm company, or I heard about this really cool seaweed company, right, that's making um, organic plastic. I want to invest in that. Sadly, private market investments tend to be only for sophisticated investors. And that tends to be from the earliest days, agile investing up to VC and private equity, uh, essentially companies that aren't listed on the stock exchange. They're, they're said to be really high risk. Mm. And so there are rules out there that say you need to hit a certain bar of earnings and they, they then mark that you have a certain level of financial mm -hmm. uh, savvy, which yeah. is, there are plenty of examples of uh, where lots of money doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're more intelligent. Um, Anyway, long story short, mm -hmm. it is difficult, but fortunately there are some new impact funds that are listed on the stock market, which give you access to either public companies that have some of these impact investment uh, credentials or a fund structure where they've been able to bring in private assets you know, and wrap them in a structure that's diversified enough, um, washed away a bit of the risk so mm -hmm. that retail investors uh, can get a piece. Can you mention a few? Of course, we're, you know, all the caveats here, then go and do your own research and all the rest, but just like for people to start doing their own research and then, of course, they should talk to their financial advisor and blah, blah, blah. Um, but where, where do we find these, uh, some of these 100%, funds? 100%, yeah, no advice, but some organisations that are making impact investment accessible, uh, Bloom Impact, it's a great little um, climate tech startup uh, that are doing this stuff. North Star is, uh, is a listed fund um, and then, of course, we've got super funds and Australia, little old Australia, 25 million people. We've got the world's fourth largest pension fund pool. That's a really powerful lever for change for individuals. Australian Ethical is, is, an, is an old one. Um, they've been doing it for a long time. I believe but they're a certified B Corp as well. Certified B Corp, that's right. And interestingly, they're also a public company, which is quite rare for super funds. Mm. But then a lot of the bigger ones... You know, the, the really large super funds, um, Aware Super, Hester, they're starting to dip their toe in this idea of impact investing, but they mm. certainly have a sustainability option, sustainable investment option. So yeah, do your own research, get mm. out there and have a look. Um, there are certainly options there and it's a really powerful lever for change. You know, vote mm. with your wallet. Um, this is your money, you decide where it goes. Um, I think, and this is the kind of topics that are the weeds that I really like to get into in my podcast, is to say, why are we as individuals having to make these decisions. And I think, you know, it is good that we have this power, but hang on, if carbon pollution is bad, if um, human rights abuse, if, if um, 
you know, smoking is bad. Why are these things, why are these companies still operating? Why are they not regulations? Why are they not taxes? Um, and that's, of course, you know, what I was talking about with carbon taxes and the challenges there, the very nature of our dependence on fossil fuels. You know, intelligent listeners will, will be across the debate and we all, we all know how difficult that is. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a really interesting balance. Uh, we have money, we make investments, we, do, we make purchases, all of which, if we do it more consciously, we can have an impact, that, that we can make those decisions. But system-wide change is the only way to solve some of these bigger issues. So the two things need to operate together. We do need government policy. Um, we do need controls on carbon emissions. And it's just a simple, pragmatic, this is how markets work, right? That there are rules and incentives. And you see it in Scandinavia and in Sweden, where they've got, I think, maybe Norway more than Sweden, but lots of uh, Teslas everywhere, right? Uh, and that's because of the financial incentives, because they do less damage to the environment. So let's give them a tax break. Suddenly they're everywhere. It's not mm. complicated. Mm -hmm. You just put a price on the negative thing and it gradually goes away. Easier said than done. Um, you put a price on fuel. It's the blood that runs through our economy. We're going to have a hit to transport. Food prices are going to go up and uh, the poorest people in our society are going to be hit the worst, right? So... But this is what governments are for. Mm. You know, they've, they've got the researchers and I'm not going to say that, that I've got all the answers, but these are the, the, the issues that I'm puzzling with and I'm really interested in the power of finance to drive mm. this stuff because you've got retail investors trying their hardest, but look, it's a small pool. Um, the government, we don't need to go into that. We've seen 10 years of no movement. Finally, we've got mm. a government making some moves, but still very slow. We're, we're mm. still opening more coal mines. But... It's the institutional investors, right? So it doesn't matter what the real canary in the coal mine is to look at what the the big um, the, the institutional investors, so the, the super funds, the insurance companies and the banks, what are they doing, right? They don't have an opinion. They don't have values, right? They've just got a mandate. They've got to deliver on your pension in 50 years. And so they're going to put their head down, they're going to do the analysis. And what's the, what's the answer? Yes, climate change is a huge risk and we're going to deal with it, mm. right? Um, super funds are, are going to pay out in 50 years. So they've got the smartest minds in the country doing the numbers and they're like, oh yeah, this is, this is bad and we've got to do something about it. So the actuaries That's working right. for the superannuation funds are saying this impact investing all the way through to ESG is a good idea. Look, I think that language is difficult um, because, again, there's no clear definitions because there's so many issues that under, you know, within ESG and impact, there's mm -hmm. social issues, there's, um, you know, gender lens investing, there's education. But if we just look at climate change, that's one issue that is very clear, that that is a, a, a clear and present danger risk to our portfolios. We've got to deal with it. Mm. It doesn't matter. They're not making an opinion about um, climate denialism or any of those sorts of things they're simply saying we're looking at the science and it's at risk i mean nasa are doing the same the u.s military have <laughs> made the same statements right still there are some groups that are um a climate mm -hmm. denial mm -hmm. so it's pretty obtuse but you know they're hanging on and the coal miners and the oil companies just want to get that stuff out of the ground so mm. um, so what like yeah. So I'm thinking, so we talked a little bit about superannuation funds here. I'm reading in, in the news about, you know, European insurers, uh, insurance companies and, and reinsurance companies who won't insure coal mines. Like what's the impact of those types of decisions when, you know, a coal mine cannot get insurance for how it runs its operations? Are these types of levers and, and, and decisions, which are obviously based on dollars and cents and a risk analysis of the future, are, are they are they leading the way? Are they making a you know a measurable impact in terms of a shift towards renewables? And you know what's the impact on maybe not just coal mines, but other industries that you see as potentially future stranded assets? I mean, look, arguably that's the number one thing making a difference, right? We have some government regulation. We do have the likes of Mike Cannon-Brooks, activist investor, trying to buy AGL, the country's biggest polluter. Um, he couldn't quite buy it. He went one better and managed to get four new board seats, almost doubled the size of the board um, with climate-focused individuals. 
Um, that's powerful. But that's, that's the activism, that, that's the values approach. Uh, look, I think he's a pragmatic investor as well, so he probably sees a company that's being badly managed that's not going to survive the new carbon-constrained world. Mm. So he's like, that's an investment opportunity. Uh, but as you said, the, the actuaries and the insurance companies, that's just how capitalism operates, right? They measure risk and they, they, make, they make their decisions. And I think this highly politicised topic, I mean, that happens every day and we don't talk about it. You know, creative destruction, companies come, companies go, but it's been so difficult to have a substitute for this energy-rich black gold in the form of coal and oil. But there have also been a lot of incentives by those that own those things to ensure that they can continue to sell it. And then the subsidies from, you know, the, it's very rare that businesses keep operating if they would, you know, be unprofitable unless it was for government welfare, which is the case in many coal mines, is my understanding, that they're basically living on welfare. A uh, lot of agriculture, um, the way it's traditionally run, particularly in the United States, they would not be able to operate unless they were on government handouts. So surely that's unsustainable given some of the ways that, you know, these organisations and businesses are being being run. Look, I mean, it's all shifting because a lot of the opponents who are wedded to, to fossil fuels and say um, any opposition to it is anti-capitalist, when you dig into it, it's kind of ridiculous because, as you said, a lot of those industries um, have a lot of subsidies and that's, from an e economics perspective, very inefficient. And, look, a lot of wind farms had a lot of subsidies to get them off the ground and, and to help them grow, but that's what the economic theory says, you know. Infant industries need that help to grow. But now, take the subsidies away and renewables are cheaper than coal. And so, as Elon Musk would say to the, the oil companies, let's get rid of all the subsidies. I'm ready, let's go, you know, let's play, let's see. Um, you know, let's let the tide go out and see who's swimming naked. Uh, and I think that's what I come back to because I think, you know, as I said, I'm a surfer, I'm an environmentalist at heart, but I also appreciate the, uh, the beauty of economics and the cleanliness of it and the accuracy. Um, of this resource allocation question and letting the system operate. And we've got 8 billion people and 8 billion minds, 8 billion decision makers building this market up, right? And so I think that uh, a lot of these things can be dealt with by an open market mm. to say, uh, and, and to drive the innovation. Right? And that's what impact investors do. They're investing in the companies that they want to see grow. Mm. And they're looking at, as I mentioned, um, great little seaweed companies, battery manufacturers, Tesla early on, we're not going to talk about Elon Musk, it's been done enough. Um, but finding these companies, uh, there's a really great company called SunDrive, right? Well, Aussie company, a couple of guys studying it, I think UNSW, I could be wrong, created a, some metric of the most efficient solar panel, and now they're going to commercialise it. And like, that's such a great story. And as mm. you said, a lot of retail investors would love to get access, but we do have a system where money can flow to those types of companies and we need to let that system run. And yeah, mm. hopefully that, that's what's gonna build the future um, rather than, oh, but we just need to, you know, we'll stop when we've dug up every drop of oil, mm. which, yeah. So platforms like Equitize or crowdfunding platforms uh, for raising capital for the, from the small investors, do you, do you have a view on those when like Zero Co from, from Byron Bay or, you know, other startups with, with an ethos um, come to market and go, hey, we need, you know, we need more funds to, to, to scale? Do you have a view on some of these platforms? Yeah, yeah. Look, I don't have a view on it from a financial perspective. I haven't run the numbers on it. But it's always been the problem that, um, you know, the efficiency of having small deals and smaller investors. You could have 10,000 investors giving a little bit, but there's transaction costs. Or you could have five big checks, much easier to manage. So that's kind of a challenge. But, but, then, but then you've got yeah. like, you know, you've got the whole fractal movement and the whole, community. you know, stake community, you know, opening up ways to, you know, buy, you know buy a hundredth of a uh, Berkshire Hathaway share, for example, like surely like the digital layer in our economy is making it easy for people to, to get access, even if they can't afford one Berkshire Hathaway share, they, you know, they might be able to buy, a, mm. you know, a small fractal component of that. 
Oh, look, I think Zero Co is a really good example. Um, such a great company. And the, there's a, I can't remember the name of it, but there's another similar company in the US uh, and he calls it the community round, right? So, you know, you've got a seed round, a series A, a series B round. What about the community round? Let's have a round up front where we can bring on all of our customers, you know, our family, all of the people that are, that are rooting for us. Let's let them jump onto the cap table. And if you're a, a consumer company like Zeroco, uh, which makes household products in, in uh, reusable containers, and not just reusable, like the pouch, the reusable pouch, you send that back to them and they wash mm -hmm. that and use that again. Mm -hmm. Amazing, they're doing really good stuff. It makes so much sense for them to build, you know, if you've got these individuals, they might only have a small shareholding, but they're, they're gonna be a customer for life. Mm. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna be a a pretty vehement uh, yeah supporter. I mean, it's a fascinating space. I just feel like there's a like listening to your podcast, The Good Future, and we've both had John Elkington, the, the wise elder, on both of our shows talking about people, planet, and and profit. It feels like there's sort of this intergenerational movement and an awakening of the ethos, and that some parts of you know the capitalist world are moving towards more sort of conscious capitalism but that even just very savvy investors who, who may not have that ethos are kind of going oh there's there's some money to be made here and like and actually i don't think that the intention really matters that much if if, if people are deploying capital towards impact investing if it's because they want to just make some money like i'm personally i'm okay with that as long as it's being deployed in a way that actually is useful for people, planet, and profit. Profit, and I think one of the ways, like the way I think about what you've described and the coalescing of worlds here, is that people tended to think that these two worlds of investing and impact were mutually exclusive. But rather, I see them as being a part of a Venn diagram. You know, and that and that's the world that you play in, and I think that's fascinating. I mean. I, like and I, you know there are eco modernists there's you know there's certainly a, a i think there's a there's a movement around the world now that is very much focused on degrowth uh, which i think is a is a message that's hard to sell um personally um when when you almost get sort of a, a communist sort of socialist approach to you know capitalism is the energy uh, enemy i kind of go like well, you know, capitalism is also, you know, one of the reasons why people innovate and why, you know, we see the rise of the circular economy of way from a, from a linear economy of take, make and waste. I think voices are important. Um, I think of my Swedish compatriot, Greta Thunberg, the, you know, the, the Swedish, I think she's still technically a teenager today. Um, she might be on the cusp of being in her 20s now. But, you know, she came out in Sweden and, and when she spoke up, flight shaming became a real thing so pre-covid in, in 2019 um, the total um, total airline industry was down four percent and they directly linked it to Greta Thunberg and the new term in Sweden flug scum which then became an international phenomenon or flight shame so the people started like I was seeing it in 2019 myself in Europe uh, doing work over there, where people are like, I'm going to take the train from 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 Munich to uh, to Amsterdam for this conference because of flight shaming, and so that you know that becomes a story that's shaming people into you know a new behaviour. In some ways, today greed is green, right? Because even very savvy investors, where it's Larry Fink or others, they're just going, hey, this new economy has so much power. You know, I think one of his statements was that, you know, clean tech, green tech, you know, renewable space will be responsible for the next 1000 unicorns. So even if you don't have a conscience, even if you don't have a soul, there's some money to be made here. Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot there. That's awesome. I don't Conscious. know if there was a question there, but you know, oh, look, we'll, we'll I'm go with it. about this stuff all day long. <laughs> Conscious capitalism, stakeholder capitalism. Mm. This is such an exciting movement. Um, I think it builds on. It's a coalescing. It's a coalescing. Um, I think we take it for granted now that we've got environmentalists, scientists, finance folks. Um, we've got the engineers. They're all now working together towards this climate challenge. I don't think we've seen that in the past. I think it was all very siloed. But now it's, um, it, it's, it's coming together in this, this amazing, powerful mix. 
And that is driving individuals are, are, are amassing. I mean, people power is just, you know, it f- forever will prove its power, right? If everybody agrees and everybody comes together, we can, we can achieve anything. Mm. Um, and I think that you've got this people power movement uh, and people are speaking with their wallets. I, we've all, you know, we're all receiving lots of packages in the mail, right? Um, and I recently bought a new iPhone. And I've been amazed and with so much pleasure when I open these boxes, I'm looking for plastic. And finally, you don't find it. You know, Amazon does it now with this crinkled cardboard. And look, sure, you know, overconsumption is a problem. And every time I do it, I think of, you know, it's still waste and they still have to ship it to me and move it. And we all need to be careful about what we buy and, and, and not buying things we don't need. But that's just one step where that's just an expectation now. Um, you buy an iPhone and everything is just paper and, it, and it's been in t- typical Apple form, it's beautiful. It's like origami, you know, the way this thing is folded and the headphones mm-hmm. are wrapped mm-hmm. around and then, boom, goes into recycling and off it goes. So I think that's really powerful. Then you've got the Gordon Gecko financialists, 100% pragmatic, look at climate tech, right? It's a, a, an avenue of, you know, venture capital, this early stage um, technology investing. And in a downturn, it's kind of the only space that's still the funds are raising money and they're deploying to these amazing companies because you've got the IRA in the US, um, the Inflation Reduction Act, huge omnibus um, legislation that's just said on so many layers, you know, all of these incentives for battery manufacturing and look, there's lots of political layers to it, but it simply comes down to um, the incentives have now shifted to climate technology. Mm. Um, and I'm seeing it in Australia, it's a lot of the um, clients I'm working with and the stories I'm telling are all about this amazing field. It's so cool. Like there's so much money flowing into it. As I said, there's lots of different groups of different kinds of scientists are now becoming almost the rock stars. Mm. Uh, the, the US and their venture capital ecosystem is an incredible machine in doing research, taking that from universities and commercializing mm. it. You know, Silicon Valley is just this incredible amazing beast in terms of research and then building teams that are similar to the research organizations and we all know the result of that in terms of you know value created Um, Australia not so good in that commercialization space we massively um, uh, punch above our weight in terms of research creation and technology creation Mm -hmm. and the smarts Um, we also have a huge pool of pension funds right we've got the money but we don't have the middle we don't commercialize it very well and we don't turn these uh, these ideas into, into businesses. That's changing. Um, I hope that in this sort of round of energy, we've got a new government that, that's steering capital towards it and regulation. So many exciting startups, you know, next year I'm planning to focus on bringing their stories to life um, and, you know, from both the startups and the investors. So um, following along there. Uh, but yeah, I'm, uh, I'm really optimistic. Mm. So um, Brené Brown, the vulnerability guru. Um, I say oh, that sounded like negative, but like the vulnerability guru who I pray to. Uh, she's fantastic. <laughs> but she says that she has this wonderful saying that story is data with a soul. What are the stories or that you know the the data sets with a soul from your client work that you love telling and and bringing to the world in terms of raising awareness around this course, but also investment strategy. Yeah. Oh, look, I think. Stories, I mean, stories are all that matters. Uh, there is the bottom line, but you don't get to the financials until you crack through with a story. Um, you hit them in the heart before the head. That's a lot of what I do in my business is, is um, pulling out these stories. But I really just think that the story we need to tell now is we need to shift the, the narrative. We need to move away from this ridiculous sort of political backwards and forwards uh, around climate denialism and whether or not we need to move on. That's sort of irrelevant. Like, uh, the, the reality is in the climate tech space, the stuff's just better. We're getting to a point now when electric vehicles are, are equally priced with an internal combustion car, but they're faster, they're more comfortable, they're cleaner. Decentralised renewable energy is now cheaper than coal. Why would we go back? And this is the story I want to tell of this optimistic future. It's not that we have to give up anything. I don't think that you're never going to win any support if you start talking about, thing, you know, we have to give things up. In, instead, it's let's look at the exciting future of having more comfortable, faster transport um, that doesn't pollute the air. And, you know, I've been looking at daycare centres for my kids 
and one of them's on a corner and it's just all day cars going past and I'm like mm. you know I've never thought about it myself in terms of breathing obviously a little bit with breathing but it's just weighing on me and I feel mm. bad every, every time that's what makes me feel really bad when I get in my car yeah so we in our family with Aurelian our one year old he's been having some breathing challenges recently I mean he's been copying all sorts of bugs from daycare and they're not on a corner but um we moved into our new home not that long ago um and it came with this really fancy european gas stove top and it's all you know natural gas which is methane and the statistics showcase according to sarah wilson who we've had on the show who's quoting scientific studies we'll put these in the show notes that the impact in terms of predicting whether a child will have asthma, if they grow up in a household that has a gas oven or gas stove and a gas heater. Gas heater's the bad one, yeah. Yeah, they're both pretty shit apparently. That it's the equivalent to growing up in a household where both parents smoke inside. And I share this news with my wife last night, who is an environmentalist, but then she's like, there's this like almost like legacy kind of going, oh, it's so nice to cook on cook on gas you know i'm like no we need to get like the induction stovetop we need to get rid of this old piece of methane you know dinosaur from our house mm. because it is very it, it is likely that our son might develop asthma we are already giving him a ventilant and it could be unrelated mm. nonetheless i'm like like as a parent, it should be sort of, you know, evident that like we need to invest in the latest technology and it's not this, you know, methane branded as natural gas, uh, which is, you know, much more harmful to the environment as well in terms of emissions um, than CO2. Well, it brings it home, doesn't it? Literally brings it home. Mm. Um, and I think that's... That's good storytelling. Well, that's right. Mm. And that's, I think the message there is that that's a story that shows the power of the story from the gas companies, because long ago they said natural gas, right? Not fossil gas, not um, petroleum waste gas, but natural gas. Mm. Brilliant story from their perspective. And that's why for so long we've been like, it's fine, it's natural gas, it's natural. Mm. And it will power our green transition. Well, that's right. I mean, there is a... If you look There's an argument. Slightly for less, <laughs> but that's irrelevant when I've moved house six months ago and we moved in and I said... And as you do when you're renting a house, I had a look in the kitchen, you go, oh, gas, good. Didn't really think of it. Um, you know, in some ways was, was thinking, well, it doesn't have gas heating, so that's okay. Um, but what I didn't do is I didn't look at the hot water in the oven. And then we move in and I find out that in this, our little kitchen, not tiny, but it's not, not big, mm. we've got a gas stove top and a gas hot water heater, which is behind a cupboard in the kitchen, mm -hmm. and a gas oven, right? None of it is fluid. There's no extraction fan. Mm. None of that is regulated, right? So I've really, I mean, I should have looked before I moved in, but there's no real recourse. There's no rules that I can say to my mm -hmm. landlord, we need something done. Um, but I then jump on and start researching this stuff and find a Guardian article and there's someone in a very similar situation that had brought in a, an air quality meter and it was atrocious and it's not just, mm. you know, it's methane, but it's all these noxious chemicals. And I stand in that kitchen and someone turns the hot water on and I've got the oven going and I'm cooking on the stove. What am I doing to myself, let alone my, my mm. little boy who's mm. in the other room? So that's got me pretty, pretty damn petrified. Mm. Um, mm. We won't go into mortgages and, and the price of housing in Australia because we could mm. be here all day. But, mm. um, you know, that's a real challenge. Uh, renters are second class citizens and there's a whole um, equity issue there. But storytelling, I think, you know, that, that's super powerful and it's going to take a lot to crack through that ideal. You know, I'm, I'm sure we were the same. Um, oh, you've got to cook with gas because it's really fast. That's what chefs do. The story we need to tell is that the new electric induction ovens are better mm. and that chefs are now putting them into their restaurants yep. and that there are now huge, you know, lend lease size buildings that are saying no gas in the whole building. Mm. Right, that's the next step for a... I don't know, five-star neighbours rating or whatever. So we need to jump ahead and tell the, the new story, right? Mm. the optimistic story that actually induction is better. This is the better technology and it's not going to make your kids sick. Um, and I think culture and change is hard and we say that, but then I think 
an example like the iPhone. It came along and there was no discussion about, oh, what about the cordless phone manufacturers? Or what about BlackBerry and Nokia? No, it was, this is amazing. I've got a supercomputer in my pocket, let's go. Mm. Um, and it was because it was better and it was faster. And I mean, the, there's no better company at branding and storytelling than Apple. But I think we forget that not everything about that phone was better. You now had to charge this thing, right? Even the first one, it only had a 24 hour battery and still incredible increase mm. in, in what it can do, but it's still only a 24 hour battery. You know, we're kind of all stuck to this tether, mm. right? Like, um, you know, diligent slaves plugging it in. That's a huge culture shift, right? And almost it's kind of a backward step that we have to plug this thing in all the time, but it was better. And so I think that's an example of the transition to the next technology step in technology is simply a matter of, of it being better um, and branding and storytelling rather than worrying about what we move on from. Mm. If it's better, creative destruction and just mm. the way it is. Well, there's this beautiful... Um and I mean, there's pros and cons to this, right? But um, and we, a little counterfactual here. Um, I often talk about the fact that you know green is the new digital, and that there's a beautiful marriage made in heaven between sustainable and digital. Uh, I think digital technologies like the iPhone, which is largely now made up of you know recycled gold and cobalt and lithium, and it's part of the circular economy. Even in the sort of planned obsolescence space, you know, we can feel good about handing back our old iPhone when we buy the new one because we know that you know a large majority of the parts will be recycled by Liam and Daisy the robots into the you know into the next model and we know that you know Apple in terms of its sourcing through supply chain etc is is very ethical and they're also investing into you know salmon gold which you know previously gold has been source of virgin uh, planetary minerals like gold has been farmed in a way that's been really really negative towards you know native uh, salmon populations so yeah. if, even down to that level if they ever do have to get virgin gold out of the ground they do it in a way that actually regenerates salmon uh, population so and we see you know tesla and bmw mercedes-benz etc you know approaching uh, mining and, and critical minerals in a similar way where the, the supply chain in many ways is becoming the new story that's winning hearts and minds um, we see procurement becoming conscious with you know sap ariba for example i think it's 4.4 trillion dollars gets moved in that you know digital supply chain b2b every year through sap ariba and they've now had this layer of social impact wrapped around it with give with that seamlessly integrates which means that you know a percentage of every deal can actually be invested um, so that both parties you know vendor and buyer can actually make sure that you know when there's a deal made some of that money will flow towards you know uh, social impact. So I feel like there's a huge movement towards all of this and that the digital layer is helping and that the digital and sustainability are, you know, working hand in hand. And at the same time with all of this, um, like Peter Rudge would tell us, F. Scott Fitzgerald would say that the test of a first-rate intellect is the ability to hold two seemingly opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. You know, the internet, if it was a country, w would be the fifth largest emitter in the world it's got 16 times the co2 emissions as as belgium you know the internet has the same emissions as the global airline industry so it's not like digital is perfect but it's fascinating to kind of like hold these two opposing ideas in mind at the same time to say that you know digital might be one of the cures you know with apple they're able to have more productivity while treading more lightly on the planet at the same time but um there is also this, you know, you know, real digital cost that, you know, even every bloody spam email that we haven't deleted or unsubscribed from or every, you know, newsletter that we're still receiving, we're like, oh, you know, delete that next time. No, just unsubscribe because there's actually a carbon emission to every bloody you know, newsletter that you're subscribing to. Make sure you get John Treadgold's and mine, of course, but, you know, the others maybe start deleting them. Any any thoughts? Sorry, that's a ramble there, but yeah. yeah. Oh, look, the cloud is not a cloud. The cloud is a is a server that's running on electricity. Mm. Um, so just remember that. And I think what's really important. There's probably people who listen to this, and they might say, "Oh, here, you know, here's these two well-off white guys who are talking about how we all need to be more sustainable." But look, he's talking about his new iPhone, and they've got cars, and 
you know, um, and they take flights, who are they to talk about these things? And it's a really strange comment. I mean, in some ways, I can understand it. Mm. But I think it's whatever steps you can take are positive. And so, rather, you know, so anybody that talks about sustainability, then they choose to drive the car and they get criticised. It's like, well, a lot of people don't have the option to get an electric car or sometimes you can't ride your bike. But if there are times when you do have the option and you ride your bike, that's positive. In the same way that people, there's now this uh, critique of wind farms and saying, look at the uh, landfill waste of these blades. They can't be recycled. They go on and on and on about this. And the answer is, well, of course, energy takes resources Mm. to generate. But the life cycle emissions of those neutrons of power is far lower from renewables. Of course, there's some cost in terms of of the the materials. But if you look at the cost of a coal-powered electron, and it's, I mean, there are so many layers because you've got to do the mining and the trucks, let alone the, uh, the, the plant to turn this rocks into, you know, turn turbines. So there are lots of disingenuous arguments. And I think we just need to look at, be optimistic about the future, um, layer that with uh, being aware of your own footprint and your own impact and not wasting things, but seeing that as an opportunity. Um, mm. to you know, save money and yeah, have, have make you a little impact. Mm. There's all these different scopes. I know my, my wife is reading uh, Gabor Mate at the moment, The Myth of Normal, and she's leaking a lot of it, like some of his arguments, which is about you know, childhood trauma and the myth of normal and the fact that a lot of kids sort of strive towards you know, acceleration and success kind of partly just to like earn the love they never got from their parents, etc. It's... Sounds like a really great read. I'm waiting for her to finish it so I can I, I can adopt it. But he also has a like a lot of comments on capitalism because he's quite he's quite left leaning. He's not necessarily proposing a better way, although there's it sounds like there like there is a there's a fascination for social democracy and even partly communism, which was a terrible polluter. Uh, I think Indira Gandhi said that the greatest polluter on earth is poverty. People having to to burn dung or you know kerosene lamps etc to, mm. to 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 cook or to get lighting for for reading etc they're all really really bad things andrew mcafee from mit would say that one of the one of the four things we need to do is to make sure that the rest of the world gets rich way faster mm. i guess i'm curious both in your perspective on is getting out of poverty um, and the sort of you know economist approach to this is that a solution or is you know is degrowth another argument? Have you got any thoughts on how we sort of innovate our way out of this mess by twenty thirty, <laughs> or are there any technologies you see? Oh, look, a lot of questions there. I mean, I think it's interesting where the word degrowth and and everything that's behind it is very similar to the idea of. Um, the problems with relying on perpetual economic growth. And Mm. in some ways, they're the same thing. But I think even economists will say that, yeah, the the economic models assume this constant economic growth. Um, You need the number to go up and to the right. Um, Our pensions rely on it. We've got more people. Growth, growth, growth. Trees don't just keep growing. They get to a certain height, and then we have entropy, and they break down, and their nutrients go back to the earth. That's... The, uh, the ecosystem we need. I think we need an ecology rather than an economy. And that's really what influences my worldview is understanding the beauty and the mathematics of economics, but then saying we need to have an enlightenment in the same way that physics did, right? Because physics has moved on from Newton. Economics hasn't moved on from this growth at all costs ideal. And perhaps that's what's happening right now. So intellectually i'm really interested in that degrowth i think i'm interested in it um but i just think it's a lot of the times they go about it the wrong way um uh, and i think that the world has just ticked over eight billion people that Mm. blows my mind and i think we hit like earth overshoot day on july 28 in 2022 yeah so do we talk about um uh the problem with too many humans right um it's not even worth talking about because what, what are you going to do whose whose family mm. gets to 
have no kids. Who, who do we get rid of, right? It's not even, it's not, mm. a, not a discussion. Mm. That's not what humans do. We need to talk about abundance. We need to talk about flourishing. We need to talk about equality. We need economics to do what it's meant to do, which is uh, more efficiently allocate resources because that's what it comes down to. Another one of those painful circular debates is Australia needs to reduce its emissions. No, it doesn't because we're only 0.1% of the world's emissions. Actually, I think it's 1%. China needs to reduce their emissions. They're a huge amount. Of course they are. They're the most populous country in the world. Australia is also has the highest per capita emissions. So you could argue it either way, mm. that Australia should be the one doing it. Oh, mm. but if we decrease our emissions by half, but that's not even, you know, that's not going to make a dent. It's actually going to make a huge dent because half a percent globally is massive for mm. such a tiny population. Uh, and if you then enforce that on China, are you saying that some of the poorest people in the world need to reduce their emissions when they're already incredibly efficient? So I think we need nuance in that discussion because that's just painful and ridiculous. I think the financial perspective is that if Australia managed to halve its emissions, imagine the technology we would have created to do that. Mm phenomenal that's the future that's the, the superpower right yes global emissions have only dropped a little bit but that's not going to stay in australia that technology we're going to be selling that to china we're going to be selling that to the world we're going to be the saudi arabias of the future and, and have the uh you know the new the new oil the new gold mm. um so i think that's where that nuance is um i don't think you can have a debate about climate change without having a debate about poverty no question. Mm. Look at the Pacific. We need to do far more to help the Pacific, and that's purely because they're our neighbours um, mm. and they're suffering. We don't have to argue about why. We just need to see people in 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 pain and suffering and help mm. them, because that's what that's what you do, and that's what wealthy countries should do. Our aid budget has been dropping year by year. Yes, we're getting better on the climate change. We need to get better on our aid spending. Mm. Lots of amazing things there. It's great to hear how much you're speaking up about these things that are like really, really important and, and, and educating and sharing your own stories, your clients' stories in all, in all of this. I sat down for a parent, um, just remembered it earlier today. I sat down for a parent-teacher interview with, with regards to my son, Lucian, who's at Montessori here, and he's been going through a few challenges at school, and we've got an occupational therapy therapist that's helping him with his like some of his hypermobility, and I feel free to go with this or not, but it like they they also said, oh, and we need to do some work on his lisp, and one of the first things you said to me when we met today after like twenty three years of not seeing each other, you're like, Anders, you might remember that at school I had a lisp, and I was like, yeah, I remember it, and it like. It triggered this like TEDx talk that I heard where Greta Thunberg said she has selective mutism and she has Asperger's, but that, you know, our house, our earth is on fire and she only breaks her silence of selective mutism when there's something really, really important to say. Um, and I remember, and I recall just, you know, how, how challenging it must have been for you to have your lisp at school. It's something I know you've worked on because I love listening to your your podcast but this like like one of the most heartwarming moments i've i think i've had all afternoon here has been to like listen to your story of speaking up your podcast is amazing and you're like you've broken through this this challenge that i know was a challenge for you and um and you're sharing your message now your story with with the world and you're you know you're escalating the stories of other people as well uh if you feel comfortable talking about that i think I think it would be amazing. And if you want to edit it out later on, we can. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, it's, um, it's, not, it's not something I've ever talked about. Um, you know, at school, it was really hard. You know, I got bullied for it and it made me shut down and really pull inside myself. And I can even feel myself, you know, a tall guy, my shoulder, you know, coming over. And that was sort of my piece in the world. And I think it's only now that I can reflect on it. And I look back and realize that I self-censored so much. I barely spoke, I didn't barely spoke. I wasn't, I wasn't sort of a recluse, but I was that typical anxious teen. You know, I was constantly, it was like I was speaking another language. I was trying to think of ways to say something without you know, putting too many yeses in there or trip mm. over my words. And I, I just wasn't myself, because you can't be when you're second guessing yourself all the time. You know, I wasn't just, having fun and the words were flowing right mm. and it, it took a long time I think when I left school I became a little bit more confident um, but then as I got older 
someone mentioned, they're like, you know, it's pretty easy. Like, I think, you know, they'd sort of, they, they had some, um, some knowledge in the space and they just said, go see someone. That's like a little tiny tweak. Um, at the same time, and this was actually when I was coming home, it was, it was crazy combination where I was leaving Byron Bay where, you know, I had the beard and the hair and I'd been surfing all day and I'm like, I'm going back to the city. And the job I got was as a finance reporter. I got this photo of me at a party before I left and I'm, you know, bearded and mm. colourful shirt. The next frame, hair's slicked back, beard's gone mm. and I'm on camera with a black tie talking about the Dow Jones. But at the same time, and I think that was me saying, this is a big change in my life. I remember what that person said. I went and got a bit of help. It took like a week, two weeks, and then boom. I suddenly could talk comfortably. And mm. you haven't been able to shut me up since. Mm. And uh, it's been great. You know, I think maybe that was a positive thing in life. I also had some problems with my back pain, with, with a back injury where I had to have surgery and I was, you know, on my back for six months, probably three years of treatment to, to be able to move comfortably again. And someone said to me in that time when I was so depressed, right, um, in the end, this is going to be the best thing that ever happened to you. And, you know, I nearly pushed him over. I'm like, shut up. I'm in pain. Mm, like, mm. I might not be able to follow my dreams. You know, will I be, ever be able to build a house, which is what I really want to do? And now that I have come out of that um, and being on my back and I discovered lots of things about myself and shifted my career, it probably was one of the best things that happened mm. to, to me. So, yeah, look, um, I've had a, a really fortunate life grew up with a great family. I'm not saying that I've been through hardship, but there are a few layers there and, mm. and, it, and it did create who I am. And um, I'm, I'm not, as, uh, not as vocal or as powerful as Greta, but yeah, in some ways, I think I found my voice and it feels good. Mm. Yeah, it's been amazing. I mean, lis listening to your voice, not just here today, but also on your, on your podcast. Um, but just listening to that, that story as well, because whether it's you or Greta or, you know, I'm sure there's lots of other people out there listening to this conversation who in some ways, whether it's because of a lisp or other, you know, other challenges are kind of just muting their authentic mm. self and what's evidently, you know, a powerful voice um, and a powerful augmenter of, of messages, not just your own, but of other people who are who are moving in a way that's, you know, culture shifting and, and awareness shifting mm. and hopefully can also create um you know very sort of conscious conscious next chapter in 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 human history so yeah just want to honor you for that for that journey because no doubt you know takes courage to heal that and for my own selfish interest as well it's great to hear that you know there are some some things we can probably do with my son he's only five um but to to work with him on his uh, on his articulation and and, and challenges, I'm, I'm sure you'll tell me lots about this afterwards. But um, yeah, yeah, interesting because I think a lot of my back problems came from hypermobility. I'm very flexible, right? Um, and and you know, as you get older and working in an office, I dropped away from that, you know, mm. the tone and the strength, mm. um, and, and my back went out. But I think I think there's a broader sort of metaphorical statement there about posture and when I was younger and so if we have these two things of, of you know back pain and, and 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 a speech problem you know I was I was hunched over and I was quiet and I was introverted and and when I got my voice back um, but at the same time I went and, and had I've probably seen 30 physios right I'm, mm. I'm pretty much a physio myself mm -hmm. right now because of because of all the the work I've done um, look I'm 40 am I 40 or 41 I can't even remember mm. but I think I'm probably the strongest and the fittest I've ever been and anybody I talk to that's got back pain you know they, they, they regret it in some ways because I'm like right and we do a we do an exercise routine and and um, and help them up but um, I saw one guy and he, and, he, and he measured me right and this was really early on when I was having a lot of problems post-surgery and he said okay and then he's like put me through a whole range of, of postural pieces of neck back you know ribs up but not flaring your chest and, and mm. tighten your butt and glutes and all this sort of thing and then he measured me I was an inch higher right wow and so I think that you know it wasn't just voice it was standing up and sure I'm tall enough and other people don't have the presence and you know, I think we're, we're both gifted in that way in, in having 
being a tall, tall man, right? There are mm-hmm. certain benefits to that in society. Mm-hmm. And I leaned into that. And it was, it was I don't know. I, mm-hmm. I think anybody can do that. They can lift themselves up. It's posture, it's attitude, mm. and using their voice and coming forward. Uh, it's powerful. Part of me wants to just pause and kind of do a little rap at that stage because I think that's a, it's a, it's a magical story. Can I just be like super annoying and <laughs> ask for like three tangible things you can lend your voice to that you think, you know, people, moms and pops, um, to, you know, institutional investors or entrepreneurs can, can do to shift towards a, a more sustainable way of life or a way that they, you know, climate change proof their finances or whatever it happens yeah well look i think i think we've talked through all of that like essentially it's a summary of what we've talked through today and trying to coalesce those things together into a a, you know a beautiful single statement that's pretty tough i might have to think that through but part of it is that i think the entrepreneur is really powerful and i think if you look at the different there's no difference between 2000 and 15 and 2022 in terms of the way an individual in an organization that changes their perspective and talks about a new way of doing things that power is still there and so the systems of finance are human made the systems of economics are human made they can change and they're changed by people Mm -hmm. using their voice and standing up so that's what we can all do we all have a super fund you can go look at you don't have to change it you can just just go look at it you know read the fine print read the fine print on the side of the bottle when you buy something in the supermarket see where it's made um, and make an informed decision and I have a lot of young finance folks who are sitting in that office they've worked really hard they're in the job they're making the money but they're not happy they want purpose and they come to me and they say what should I do and it's amazing like I love having that role and having that audience, I think it's a huge responsibility because there are a few individuals back in you know, my life that have given me advice and not even thinking about its advice, just a little offhanded thing they've said and mm. it's had a big impact. So when people do ask me, I'm um, careful not to plant seeds that are gonna send them in the wrong direction, but just say, you have power, use your mm. voice, stand up tall, um, you can make the change. And for those in finance, this is an amazing opportunity I think mm. this is the future. I think my biggest shout out or my biggest request is to the young economic students who are in the classroom at university. And when the old school, the non-progressive lecturer is talking about how- Milton infer- Friedman. When yeah. Milton Friedman is up the front <laughs> and he's talking about the only role of business is mm. to make a profit, put your hand up, just ask questions. Mm. You don't even have to have all the answers but a lot of this stuff is just mm. you can just tell from your own life that a lot of this stuff isn't mm. isn't the way the world really works mm. um, and that's something I wish I did more when I was in economics class is rattle the cage mm. a bit and mm. ask those questions mm. so yeah mm. maybe if this reaches out to some of them they can they can start doing that yeah full circle to being generation Y and asking the question why W-H-Y <laughs> so there you go John Treadgold thank you so much for coming up to Avalon Beach and spending some time sharing your wisdom on, on the second renaissance Anders it's amazing you've done really well yourself um, amazing cycle we knew each other for that first 20 years now another 20 years we'll see where we are when we're 60 yeah I know the world's yeah. going to be a different I, place I, it, it certainly will be hopefully a more sustainable place it's got to be otherwise we won't be here yeah, that's too <laughs> true <laughs> on that note Uh, Thank you guys for listening. For more information about the Second Renaissance and our work on sustainable innovation, please visit my website, www.andersumanilson.com. We would appreciate if you can take a moment to share the podcast with a friend or a colleague and help build the movement. We hope that what we learn together on the Second Renaissance can help us all build a sustainable future for ourselves and our children. See you in the near future.